About a month ago, during her, her sermon, Charlene invited each of us to reflect on how we came to be here and how we've grown. And Tracy shared some of her story answering that invitation in the moment for stewardship last week. This invitation to reflect on when and how we came to be here really struck me because I had just attended the funeral of a lovely man who had served as a group facilitator in the grief support program I work for at Catholic Charities, which is a program for individuals and families that have lost loved ones to suicide. And mostly I knew him in this one role as a facilitator. But at his funeral, I learned so much more about his journey through life. I was particularly drawn in by the story of how he and his wife met as teenagers at a high school dance. And they fell in love and became lifelong partners. I learned more about their journey, which included a long history of pleasure, but also pain, including the death of their son, one of their sons to suicide, which is how I came to know the two of them. They invested deeply in their relationships and in the causes they care about, one of them being the loss program that I work for. And at his death, they requested that donations be given to the loss program in lieu of flowers. I will always remember how it felt to co-lead a support group with them. You could feel their dedication to each other and to the group members. And John, in particular, was always very humble in the way that he would lead a group. The priest who preached his funeral mass talked about how John very likely would have been a bit squeamish at the attention he was receiving that day, and everyone kind of chuckled in agreement. Last Sunday, Paul preached on the passage in Luke's Gospel where wealthy landowners <clears throat> were transformed after they asked Jesus to increase their faith. And he stressed how dramatic a transformation they underwent, changing from people who always put themselves first to people who saw themselves as servants of others. The last line of verse 10 in the passage reads, So you also, when you have done all that you have been asked to do, say, we are ordinary servants. We have only done what was our duty. Now the concept of duty may be burdensome for some of us, and it may feel more burdensome when it's connected to the need to support the church financially, which is probably one of the reasons that I do not relish this particular duty of being asked to speak to you about the importance of making a financial pledge. But I don't know that the idea of duty needs to feel burdensome. It can feel otherwise. I recently received a letter from another lovely gentleman, the man who hired me in my first social work job 30 years ago. And in his letter to me, he talks about duty, saying, duty is perhaps the most powerful word in Hinduism. He's a, he's a Hindu practices Hinduism. He's, an, he's an, in, a man of Indian descent, now living in, in Trinidad, but he's Hindu. He goes on, each one of us has duties to perform at various stages of our lives. Duty simply means a coordination of thought, word, and deed with the understanding of promoting the highest good for the highest number of people or beings. Duty expressed in these terms sounds and feels transforma transformational, similar to the way the scripture laid out transformation in the gospel reading in Luke last week. 
Last Sunday when I left church, I was surprised when one of my favorite uh, podcasts that I listened to on Sunday afternoon uh, was focused on the economics of religion. The podcast is called uh, Freakonomics, and uh, it's hosted by an economist, uh, Stephen Dubner. Uh, it's a lot of fun for anyone. Uh, so I listen to this every Sunday afternoon, and last Sunday they were focused on the economics of religion. The host interviewed several economists, uh, one of them including Lawrence Yannacone, who was the director of the Institute for the study of religion, economics, and society at Chapman University. Dr. Yannacone uses economics to study religious giving, church attendance, denominational growth, extremism, international trends, and other aspects of religion and spirituality. Now, I didn't read his book chapter on the economics of religion, and I didn't read his other publications. I just listened to the podcast. And the, the podcast last uh, week was actually primarily focused on the rise of religious prayer apps and the millions of dollars of venture capital that have flown into, uh, flowed into prayer apps uh, during the pandemic. That was mostly what it was about. Anyway, that was also fascinating. But one of the interesting things that Dr. Yannacone has found in his research is that faith follows involvement. That faith is sustained through social interactions and investment in the life of the church. He stressed that there are positive associations between measures of well-being and happiness on the one hand and measures of religious involvement, including giving, on the other. And at another point in the podcast, he stated that the research has found a strong and consistent positive association between rates of giving and happiness. So we might consider supporting the church financially as something that we are privileged to do, not something that we have to do, but something that we get to do, and as an act that can be transformative on multiple levels. But if the idea of personal and institutional transformation seems like too big an idea for you to swallow, consider pledging because doing so just might contribute to your own happiness. 